Okay, so for the most part, unit two is on merchandising, which is getting goods from a manufacturer to the consumer. But within unit two, we put in something that I think is vital for anybody in business to be able to understand, and that is statistics. Now I realize that word carries a little bit of fear with it, but we're only spending two weeks on statistics. So there's not a whole lot of damage I can do. I just want to go over some of the basics, which is gathering data, how to properly gather data, and then how to organize it, and then to do just a slight beginning calculation bordering on the analysis of it, just to know what it means a little bit. So the first thing that needs to be understood, even as just a good consumer, is where statistics come from and how they are gathered. Um, when we look at some of our vocabulary, statistics deal with a population. A population is a group that we're trying to learn about. Or word is a group we want to learn about. Um, for example, let's say that WITC wants to know what is the average age of its students. The population would be all WITC students. That's the group that we want to learn about. Now, in the example I just gave you, WITC can just go into the computer system, pull up the information on all the students, and find the average age if they want to. But in some cases, the population is a little bit too large and possibly even vague. For example, let's say I want to know, um, want to predict at least who's going to win the next presidential election. Well, there the population is a little bit fuzzier. It's not the presidents, not the presidential candidates we want to learn about. It's actually the voters. So voters would be our population. And not just all registered voters, but the voters who are going to vote in that election. We don't care about the ones who stay home. They won't affect the result. Now, first of all, it would not be possible for us to determine who is going to vote and who is not. So defining, getting that exact population is going to be a little difficult there. Second, it's still, even with those that aren't going to vote, is an extremely large population. There are a lot of reasons why we would not want to go out there and ask everybody who is going to vote, even if we could determine who will vote and who won't, why we wouldn't want to go out and ask everybody. One is the expense. Every person that you ask is going to cost you a little bit of money, whether it's a phone call, um, a mailed survey, or whatever, it's going to be expensive. Second is time. You just take a long time. By the time you are done surveying all the people, the election probably be over and done. Also, there's the whole idea of time, and in cases like that, you might cause changes in the population. The person you asked first, by the time you get done asking the last person, that first person may have changed their mind. So to be a true gathering of information, it has to be a snapshot. It has to be in a small enough time frame that it's, it's accurate, that things haven't changed for anybody else in that time. Now, the example I gave about voters doesn't fit into this, but I'll give you another example. Now, the word destructive isn't one that you necessarily see coming out in statistics a lot, but if you're looking at manufacturing, one of the big places for statistics is in quality control. If we're doing product testing, um, let's say we have a, a screw that we've produced, and that screw needs to be able to hold a certain amount of force. In order to test to see if the screw can hold that force, we're going to put it in some sort of a device. Pretend that looks like a screw. And we're going to either pull on it or press on it or whatever we need to test to see if it'll hold. And we're going to apply a force until the screw breaks. And whatever force it breaks at, we record that and we compare it to what it's supposed to be to make sure it's high enough. Well, the problem with this is it destroys the piece. Whatever we're testing is destroyed. We don't want to test every piece because then there's nothing left to sell because we broke every piece. So because of these limits on, and there's more reasons why we wouldn't want to get to every piece in a population. But because of those limits, instead of doing the whole population, we look at a sample. 
And a sample is nothing more than a smaller group from within the population. The key to statistics is selecting what we call a representative sample. What that means is the way things break down in the sample has to be similar, close to the way things break down in the population. So let's say we're looking at our population. And let's stick with our example of voting for president. Let's say that our sample shows that 60% of the people sampled are going to vote for candidate A. In our population, it better be close to 60% that's going to vote for candidate A. It can't, if it's something like 25%, now, we don't know for sure because we can't talk to the whole population. But if that is way off from what our sample shows, that was not a very good sample. It wasn't representative of the population. So in order to try to get a representative sample, there are several things that we have to consider. One of them is sample size. There are roughly 310 million eligible voters in the United States. If we were to sample 200, probably not an adequate sample size. So when you're looking at a lot of the stuff on the news, you know, where they're looking at surveys of, you know, 34% approval ratings or 28% of citizens are in favor of, of this proposal, the first thing you have to look at is the sample size. If you're looking at a population of a few thousand and they've sampled three or four hundred, that might be adequate. If you're looking at a population of a couple hundred million and they've sampled three or four hundred, probably not big enough. Second thing is distribution. The state of Wisconsin has over four million eligible voters. So we survey every eligible voter in the state of Wisconsin. We get 4 million people in our sample. That's a relatively large sample, but it's not distributed well. It's concentrated into a single area. Viewpoints in Wisconsin might be quite different from, let's say, Texas or California. At least hopefully they are. So that would not be a great way of doing it. You need to make sure that the sample is spread out throughout the whole population. And the third it has to be random. There are a lot of different meanings of random and a lot of different levels of random, and we're not going to get into that. The, the most basic definition of random that we're going to look at is that every member of the population has an equal chance of being in the same. So you can't just go survey as many voters in Wisconsin as you can because voters from other states have no chance of being in the sample. That's not random. You can't go stand outside schools and survey people coming and going from schools because you're only going to get school employees, students, or parents that have children in school. That's not random. People that are not involved in the school in any way have no chance of being in that sample. So there are little things like that you have to be careful of. We're not going to get any further into the whole idea of random samples and type of samples. And we're not going to get into this, the required sample size at this point either because there's a lot of different theories behind it. And it's not really necessary for, for our purposes here. But it's something I wanted to point out that it is very important to make sure that the data you're looking at is well gathered. Um, I worked for a short period of time at a survey center in Madison and it was not uncommon for us to get surveys from companies that were required by some federal regulatory agency to do a survey. 
So we'd get the official request and then somewhere on a scrap of paper would be written what they needed the results to come out as. It was our job to make sure the survey gave them the results that they wanted and make it look good for whatever agency was requiring it. So once we've selected a sample, now, if we're doing a survey, of course, there's a lot more you can do, but the way you design the testing that you're going to do makes a big difference. Um, for example, let's say we're looking at trying to increase your taxes, increase funding for local schools. Um, if we say, would you be willing to pay more in taxes? to improve conditions in our schools. What's the first thing that most people see in that question? Pay more in taxes. Perfect. Now this may seem like an innocent little switch, but if it meant Improving conditions for our children in schools. Would you be willing to pay more in taxes? There now the first thing they see is improving conditions for children in schools. Well, of course I'm in favor of improving conditions for children in schools. Um, one of the things is that the average person pays attention to about the first six to eight words of any statement they hear. So in that first few words of the statement, if you mention taxes or increasing taxes, they've already made up their mind that the answer is no, I don't want that. If at the beginning of that statement you brought up improving things for children, oh, well, then yes, they're already in favor. They don't even hear the rest of that statement. So the way questions are worded can be huge. Um, another thing that was done was the way things were presented. Um, we sent out, it's kind of an experiment, we sent out a bunch of surveys, political-based surveys, and we got permission and we actually got, we purchased envelopes from both the Democratic Party and the Republican Party of Wisconsin. And in those envelopes we sent out identical surveys. The only difference was there was a marking at the top of the page so that we could identify which envelope it was sent out in. 500 were sent out in envelopes that were labeled from your Democratic Party of Wisconsin. The other 500 were from the Republican Party of Wisconsin. Well, guess what? First of all, we only received back about 150 of each. Voluntary surveys get a very low response. But the ones that were sent out from the, in the Democratic envelopes came back with much more Democratic-based opinions, much more liberal opinions. The Republican Party ones came back with much more conservative ones. If you think about it, if, you're, if you identify as being part of the Democratic Party or having views similar to their party, and you get a letter that says from the Republican Party of Wisconsin, what happens to it? Do you open it? No, it goes in the trash without even being opened. So I mean, little things like that that are done to determine who's going to be part of a survey or who you're going to gather information from. There are other dirty practices like stacking surveys and things like that where you ask a few questions first to determine whether somebody's going to be part of the survey and, and other things that we're not going to get into. Just I want you to be aware that there are thousands of ways to distort how people respond to a survey that look very legitimate but have a huge effect. Psychology is actually a big part of statistics. So what we're going to concentrate on now from here on out is we're going to look at organizing data. So our first step is to take a list of raw numbers. And since we're in a math class, I'm just going to look at test scores. And I'm making these up as I go, so don't, don't get excited. So I'm just going to put a list down here. Five. Let's just put up like seven or eight scores here. Oh, that's good enough right there. So if those are the scores I have, um, one of the things I can do, now a list like this that has what, 
eight scores up there isn't hard to look at and take in all at once, just as individual scores. But if that list were longer, you know, 20 or 30 scores, I wouldn't be able to do that. So one of the things I'd want to do is I'd want to be able to organize it somehow. And the first step in organizing raw data is something called a frequency table. A frequency table organizes the data into groups. The way that's done depends on the type of data. What we have here are numbers. So this is numerical data. Um, numerical data is basically any sort of information where the answer to the question is a number. What was your score on the last test? How tall are you? What is your age? Those are all numerical examples of numerical data or numerical variables. So for this set here, um, sometimes there are natural divisions in the data that make sense to organize it in. Since this is a grade on a test, it would make sense to organize it as your grades, A, B, C, D, and F. So I might list this grade range. Um, let's do 93 to 100, which is your A's. 85 to 92 for the B's. 77 to 84. And 70 to 76. Now, one thing that the book states, and it is true to some extent, is that these ranges should all be exactly the same size. In this case, they're not quite the same size. The, the exception to that is if there is a natural division in the data that makes more sense. These are really close. Um, there are seven or eight units in size, depending on which one it is. But since there's a natural division, which is your, your letter grades, it's okay. If you're just taking like heights or ages or something like that, then you'd want to make sure those groups are all exactly the same size. What's going to go over here then is the frequency. In other words, how many scores, in this case, fell within each of those ranges. So from 93 to 100, let's come up here. There's one, two that fell in that range. So there are two that fell in the 93 to 100 range. 85 to 92. One, two, three, it looks like. There's three in the B range. 77 to 84. One, two. And 70 to 76. There's one of them. So what this frequency table now allows me to do is I can look at this and relatively quickly pick out 85 to 92, which is the B range, is the one that had the most students within that range. The D range, 70 to 76, only had one. That was the lowest frequency. From this frequency table, I can further organize my data into different types of frequency tables and into graphs. Um, other types of frequency tables might be relative frequency tables. A relative frequency can be given either, either as a percent or a decimal. The relative frequency is given by taking that raw frequency divided by the total. So for this one here, first of all, we have to find the total. How many total scores are there here? 2 plus 3 is 5, plus 2 is 7, plus 1 is 8. So for the relative frequency for 93 to 95, it's 2 divided by 8, or 0.25. 85 to 92, it's 3 divided by 8, 0.375. 77 to 84, 2 divided by 8, 0.25. And finally, the 70 to 76 is 1 divided by 8, or 0.125. That is one way of expressing the relative frequency. Now, depending on the textbook you're looking at, and who your instructor is. Sometimes they, they consider relative frequency and percent frequency to be the same thing. Sometimes they consider them to be different. Um, the subtle difference would be percent frequency. Instead of 0.25, we would list it as 25%. 0.125, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0.25, 0
0.375 would be listed as 37.5 percent. 0.25 is again 25 percent, and 12.125 would be 12.5 percent. As you're looking at these, of course, in an ideal world, the relative frequency would add up to be exactly one, and the percent frequency would add up to be exactly 100 percent. We divided by eight here, so it worked out perfect. If you had an odd total, like 99 or 41 or something like that, some of these numbers are going to be rounded off. So it might not add up to exactly 1 or 100%. It might be 0.999 or 1.001. .001. That's okay as long as it's close. Another type of frequency table that we can run into is something called a cumulative frequency table. The cumulative frequency table also goes off of numerical data, and it requires the data to be organized a little bit different. You can see here, I had the higher scores on top down to the lower scores on bottom because, you know, generally the A's are considered better. In a cumulative frequency table, we have to start out with the lower numbers first. So let's take a look at heights. Now, I'm not going to give you raw data. I'm just going to make up a frequency table here. So let's look at height ranges and frequencies. Now I'm going to make sure I set this up so that each range is exactly the same size. So let's say that the shortest person in our our data here ends up being 58 inches. I'm going to make my first range 58 to 62. Now assuming everybody is rounded off to the nearest inch, so I don't have to worry about 62 and a quarter or 62 and a half, I'm going to start my next group at 63, which would be the next number. How far do I need to go? Well, from 58 to 62 is 4. So adding, three to, or adding 4 to 63 is 67. Next group starts at 68. Where's it going to end? 72. Then 73 to 77. And we're going to assume that we don't have anybody in our groupings more than uh, 6 foot 5. So we're looking at the frequency. Oh, let's put in 8 people between 58 and 62. Eighteen between sixty-three and sixty-seven. Twelve between sixty-eight and seventy-two, and seven from seventy-three to seventy-seven. Pretty decent little distribution. A cumulative frequency distribution. Is taking all numbers that are at or below that current frequency. For example, this would be listing all the people that are less than or equal to 62 inches, which is just 8. The next one, next group goes up to 67. We want to know how many are less than or equal to 67. Well, that's 18 plus the 8 from the previous group, or 26. The next group goes up to 72. So less than or equal to 72. Now I, that's the 12, the 18, and the 8, but I don't have to add all of them up. I can just add 12 to my previous 26 to get 38. I'm going to pause there. Any questions on where the 38 came from? I'm just adding up these three to get a total up to that point. And then for less than or equal to 77, that would be... 45, good. Just 7 plus the rest of them adds up to 45. We should note, by the way, that if we add up our total frequencies here, there's 45 of them. Those two numbers better be the same. So we have different types of frequency tables. From those frequency tables, 
as I said, we can organize them into graphs. But before I talk about graphs, I want to talk about the other type of frequency table, the other type of data, which is categorical data. Categorical data is basically any sort of a question that the answer is going to put you into a category. Um, categorical data is all your yes or no questions. Are you in favor of this proposal? Um, do you like this candidate? That's categorical. Other things might be like favorite color. That is categorical. It's going to put you in a category. Your answer is not going to be a number. If you ask your favorite color, you're not going to answer seven, right? So the frequency table for this is actually quite a bit simpler than our frequency table for numerical data because we don't have to worry about ranges anymore. We're just going to be looking at dividing them up into different categories. So let's say we're looking at our favorite color as being the question we're asking. And we're going to limit your, color, your choices to red, blue, and green. And I'm just going to make up some data again. I'll use color that's in there. Um, let's say that for red, we had 12 people answer they liked red. 18 answered that they preferred blue, and 10 that they preferred green. To see if you remember how to do it, let's have all of you quickly in your notes fill in the relative frequency for those categories. So what is our first step in finding relative frequency? Find the total. So if we add these all up, we get 40. So now that we know the total frequency, how do we find the relative frequency for red? 12 divided by 40, which will give us 0.3. Perfect. For blue, 18 divided by 40, which is... 0.45. For green, 10 divided by 40, 0.25. Let's double check what should those all add up to? 1. So we add those up, they do add up to 1.00. For doing percent frequency, you just move the decimal point for each of those 30%. 45% and 25%. And of course, those should then add up to 100%. Any questions? Okay. So we can organize our data in a table for categorical data as well. Cumulative frequency does not work for categorical data because there is no smallest to largest. So from the frequency table, I'm going to go back to my table for heights again. I'm going to have to make up new data. Yeah, I can go ahead and copy it. I'm too lazy to make up a new table. The wonders of technology, right? There's my table for heights. From this table, I can further organize the data into a little bit more usable or more consumable version by putting it into graphs. Depending on whether the, date, the table is containing categorical or numerical data, there's slight differences in the types of graphs we can create. One of the graphs we can create from numerical data it looks a lot like a bar graph, but it is called a histogram. We'll look at a bar graph when we look at categorical data in a couple minutes. A histogram is really just a bar graph. The difference is, along the bottom axis, instead of having labels, we have the number ranges. 
So this is going to be labeled as height ranges here. And what's going to be here is 58 to 62, 63 to 67, 68 to 72, and 73 to 77. Up the left side, then, we're going to have our frequency. We need to make sure then that we have, in order to make sure that we have an adequate access there, we need to look and see what our largest number is. Our largest frequency is 18. So the numbering up this axis has to go up to at least 18. A lot of people make the mistake they try to number by ones, which makes it really crowded. Um, I'm going to take the easiest road I can think of that's still accurate enough. I'm going to go by fives. Now this next little part is one of the subtle, you know, we've already had the number ranges on the bottom axis. It's one of the second differences between a bar graph and a histogram, and this one's kind of subtle. But in a histogram, the bars connect to each other. They touch each other. So 58 to 62 at a frequency of 8. So I'm going to draw a bar here that goes from 0 up to 8, all the way over to the far edge of that category and down. So the height of that bar is 8. So that shows us, in the range of 58 to 62, there are 8 people. 63 to 67, there's 18. So starting at the beginning of the 63 to 67, right up against the side of the 58 to 62, we extend our bar up. 18 would be about here, so up to there, over, and then down. 68 to 72 is 12, so the same thing. We start here, we extend our bar up. 12 is about here, so right from there. And up to the 12, over, and then down. 73 to 77 is 7, which is going to be just lower than this one, so somewhere in here. So up to 7, over, and down. Like I said, these bars touch each other. They're tight together. The reasoning for that is since these are numerical ranges, and they one goes from... In, they progress from one to the other. There's a natural order and a natural connection between them. The bars are tight together to show that connection. In a bar graph, like if we did one for the favorite color, there would be spaces between them because there is no connection between red, blue, and green. They can be put in any order. There's no, no numerical blending between them. So that's a histogram. Like I said, it's basically a bar graph with number ranges on the bottom. Other types of graphs we could do from this, we could do a circle graph or a pie graph. In the pie graph, we would have to have our relative frequency or our percent frequency data. Usually we do percent frequency. So we'd have to have our total here. What's the total? 45, very good. We'd have to figure out the percent for each of these. So 48 divided by 45 is going to give us, it's late at night, I'm going to use a calculator. Point, 0.1777, so 17.78%. Eighteen divided by forty-five is going to be what's that? Point four, so forty percent. Twelve divided by forty-five. Twenty-six point six seven percent. Good. And seven divided by forty-five. Fifteen point five six. Now here's a case because these are rounded off. If I were to add those up, I think it actually comes out to one hundred point zero three. If I add those up. So it's not exactly 100, but it's close enough. To make our pie chart or circle graph, back in the good old days, we would find you know, 360 degrees for a full circle, find 17.78% of 360 degrees, and mark it out with a protractor. Well, 
in modern times, we don't need that because there's computer programs that will do that exactly for us. You can go into Excel and very quickly type them in and it'll give you a perfect circle graph. So for our purposes, all we're worried about is getting close enough to understand what the graph means. So to use that, I'm just going to use benchmarks. A quarter of a circle is what percent? 25%. Half of a circle is 50%. So I'm going to use those benchmarks to graph these categories. Anything on here that's close to that? Well, I can see here the 68 to 72 is 26.67%, which is slightly more than 25. I'm just going to put that on there and make it just slightly bigger than a quarter circle. So that is 68 to 72. Nothing else really close. Um, the 40% is a little bit less than half. Something like this, maybe, for 40%. That is 63 to 67. Now, to be in good form, since these two have kind of gone around in the circle like this, I should put the 73 to 77 next to this one. That's 15%. 17%, so this one should be slightly smaller. Good luck with that. Huh? So that's my 73 to 77. And then, of course, 58 to 62. Now you can see these aren't exact. If I were looking at these, I'd have a really hard time telling which one's bigger between those two. But it's close enough to get our point across. That is one of the weaknesses of a graph, by the way, is that a graph is not good at distinguishing between things that are close. Even over here, in my histogram, it might be a little difficult to tell between these two which one's higher. They're fairly close to each other. If you want exact numbers, you should refer back to the table. The graph is good at giving approximate numbers and a very quick reference. Here I can see really quickly that the largest number of people fell in the 63 to 67 range. Here I can see rather quickly, again, largest numbers in the 63 to 67 range. If I wanted to know the exact number of any of those ranges, though, it's not so easy to get from a graph. This one isn't terrible because I don't have a lot of a high frequency. Okay, so let's look at categorical data then. Organizing categorical data, back to our favorite color. We've already done our relative frequency data, percent frequency, 30%, 45%, and 25%. I'll be good. To organize categorical data, instead of a histogram, we would use a bar graph. We've already pointed out some of the differences between a histogram and a bar graph. Um, another difference is that a bar graph can go in either orientation. We could do this with our colors on bottom. Like this. Or the colors could be on the side. In either case, we have to have a scale going up the other axis of the graph that is large enough to accommodate our largest frequency. Well, again, that's 18. So, like that. I'm going to label by fives again just because I don't want to give you more detail. Our bars then, unlike the histogram, are going to have space between them. There is no natural connection from red, blue, and green. There isn't even a natural order that they should go in. I could put them in any order I want to. So the bar for red is going to have to go up to 12. That's somewhere in here. The bar for blue has got to go up to 18. That's somewhere in here. For green, goes up to 10. Right about there. So there's our bar graph. So big differences are K 
categories down here instead of number ranges, spaces between the bars, and it could have been laid on its side if we wanted. Imagine they got a number two down here. Any questions? I don't think I have to go through the circle graph again for categorical data, so we're going to let that go. There's another type of graph that we can put in here that's a little bit different. What we've done so far is what we considered a snapshot. Both the categorical data and numerical data we've looked at, um, categorical for favorite color, height, for numerical height and grades and whatever, they're considered a snapshot, a single moment in time trying to get values. Another type of data that we look at, this is called time series data. Time series data doesn't look at several values like the snapshot does. You know, we had different colors, we had different ranges of heights. Time series data looks at one variable, one category, if you will, and looks at its changes over time. Um, for example, we might look at tuition at WITC. Or actually, so I don't get in trouble, let's look at tuition at some theoretical college. And tuition, we're going to go per credit. So let's say in the year 2000, the tuition per credit was $92. In 2005, it went up to $101. 2010, big jump, 138. And 2015, 144. To graph time series data, what is most often used and what's most useful is a line graph. In a line graph, what goes along the bottom is our time sequence. In this case, it is years. Um, it might be months, days, or whatever. Um, a common use of a, of a line graph might be graphing the temperature from month to average temperature from month to month. So along the bottom here, I'm going to put 2000, 2005, 2010, and 2015. Up the side, I have to have some sort of a scale that covers all those numbers. Now, here's something that isn't necessarily great form, but sometimes it's necessary to make things make sense. I'm going to do this. What that little symbol means is I'm not numbering from 0 all the way up. I'm starting somewhere other than 0 in my numbering. Because my smallest number is 92, it wouldn't make sense to have all that empty space from 0 to 92. So I'm going to do this, 90, 100, 110, 120, 130, 140, 150. In just a second, I'm going to show you why this is kind of frowned upon in some cases. So anyway, near 2000, it was 92 bucks. So I'm going to put a dot somewhere in there. 2005, 101, would be somewhere in here. 2010 jumping to 138 would be somewhere in here. And 2015, 144. I'll move this one over just a little bit. Get a little closer. Then I'm going to connect those with a line. Now, a lot of people want to connect a line to here. That line doesn't mean anything because it was not zero before that. It had some value. We just don't know what it is. So we're starting at 2010. Now, a couple of things we can get from a line graph very quickly. First of all, if I were to ask you during what range did the cost of tuition increase the most rapidly, if we look for the line, it's the steepest. Between 2005 and 2010 was the most rapid rate of increase. We cannot tell whether it had a huge jump in one year or if it steadily jumped over those years, but during that period when we had the largest increase. Where we had the smallest increase, well, this one might be a little tricky. These two parts of the line both have about the same slope to them. This went up by $9. This went up by well, 6 
So you can tell that this one is more down here, but it's hard to tell that off the graph because they're close. Like I said before, a graph is good for telling extremes, but not small details of the data. Of course, a line graph would also be really quick to see if there's any spot where the tuition went down. In this case, it never did, so we don't have that on our graph. Anybody have any questions on these? I know I'm flying through the graphs, but I'm assuming that for the most part we've seen them before, so it's just a quick little reminder of each of them. I promised you I'd talk about this little symbol here. There's a reason why that symbol is kind of frowned upon. I tend to be a purist when it comes to statistics. I think that anything you can do to be the most honest um, representation of the data and to do as little as possible to try to fool the public, I guess, to me the better. I'm all about the ethics behind it. So if I'm using that symbol. Let's say I want to compare the net profit for three companies. And let's do this. Companies A, B, and C. And this is going to be profit in millions. And I'm going to label my axis 140, 150, and 160. Company A is 148 million. Company B, 159 million. And Company C is 144 million. Looking at this graph, it's nice to have this little break in the axis because now I can more clearly see the differences between them. But if I don't notice that symbol there, I can look at this graph and it's all it's very easy to think that the net profit for company B is almost twice as much or more than twice as much than the other two companies because that bar is twice as tall. Whereas if I didn't have that symbol in there, I'd probably label what 20, 40, 60, 80. Probably cut myself off here, but 120, 140, 160. That's how you space them. Pretend those are evenly spaced. So company A at 148 is going to be somewhere there. Company B, oops, that doesn't work, but that's 48, not 140. 148 is going to be somewhere in here. Company B was 159, somewhere in here. And Company C at 144, somewhere in there. With this representation, you can see that they're really close to equal. Not a huge difference between any of them. The disadvantage to this representation is, well, we can hardly even tell which one's bigger, A or C. So there are advantages each way. It's just something to be careful as you're looking at graphs and reading statistics. Be careful for little things like that that might change how you perceive them. Okay, with that, it is time for our break. So I'm going to end this session, and we'll come back at 631 for the next hour.